Bayopusi, Wikipedia article audio. The Bayopusi Master Who Embraces Simplicity, written by the Jin Dynasty scholar Ji e. Hong, is divided into Esoteric Neopian, Inner Chapters and Exoteric Wapian, Outer Chapters. The Deist Inner Chapters discuss topics such as techniques for Xian, Immortality, Transcendence, Chinese Alchemy, Elixirs, and Demonology. The Confucianist Outer Chapters discuss Chinese literature, legalism, politics, and society. The eponymous title Baopusa derives from Ji e. Hong's Hao Sobriquet, pseudonym Baopusi, which compounds Bao. Embrace, hug, carry, hold in both arms, cherish, pur. Uncarved wood, person's original nature, simple, plain, and zi. Child, offspring, master. Baopu is a classical allusion to the Dao Jing, evince the plainness of undyed silk, embrace the simplicity of the unhewn log, lessen selfishness, diminish desires, abolish learning and you will be without worries. Title History Ji Hong's autobiography explains choosing his pen name Baopuzi. It has been my plan to preserve regularity and not to follow the whims of the world. My speech is frank and sincere, I engage in no banter. If I do not come upon the right person, I can spend the day in silence. This is the reason my neighbors call me Simplex, which name I have used as a sobriquet in my writings. Compare these autobiography translations. People all call me a Pau Pu scholar, among the people of his district there were those who called him the scholar who embraces simplicity. Wu and Davis noted, this name has been translated old sober sides, but Dr. Wu considers that it has no satirical intent and would better be translated solemn seeming philosopher. Fabrizio Pregadio translates master who embraces spontaneous nature. Compared with many other Deist texts, the origins of the Baopusi are well documented. Ji Yi completed the book during the Jian Yu era, when Emperor Yuan of Jin founded the Eastern Jin dynasty, and revised it during the Xian He era. Ji Yi Hong's autobiography records writing the Baopusi. Content in my twenties I planned to compose some little things in order not to waste my time, for it seemed best to create something that would constitute the sayings of one sole thinker. This is when I outlined my philosophical writing, but it was also the moment when I became involved in armed rebellion and found myself wandering and scattered even farther afield, some of my things getting lost. Although constantly on the move, I did not abandon my brush again for a dozen or so years, so that at the age of 37 or 38 I found my work completed. In all, I have composed NEIP in 20 scrolls, Wei Pien in 50. My NEIP, telling of gods and genii, prescriptions and medicines, ghosts and marvels, transformations, maintenance of life, extension of years, exorcising evils, and banishing misfortune, belongs to the Taoist school. My Wei Pien, giving an account of success and failure in human affairs and of good and evil in public affairs, belongs to the Confucian school. Compare the more literal translation of Davis and CHN, I left off writing for ten and odd years, for I was constantly on the road, until the era Qian Wu. When I got it ready. Inner Chapters Ji's autobiography mentions his military service fighting rebels against the Jin dynasty, and successfully defending his hometown of Zhurong. In 330, 
Emperor Cheng of Jin granted Ji Yi the fief of Marquis of Guangzhou with income from 200 Jurong households. Scholars believe Ji Yi revised the Baopusa during this period, sometime around 330 or 332. The Baopusa consists of 70 pn. chapters, books divided between the 20 inner chapters and 50 outer chapters. Nathan Sivan described it as not one book but two, considerably different in theme. The Neopian and Wapian led entirely separate physical existences, they were not combined under a single title until a millennium after Ko's time. The Ming Dynasty Dea Zhang Dea Ist Canon first printed the two Baopusa parts together. This Zheng Tong Dea Zhang Dea Ist Canon of the Zheng Tong era bibliographically categorized the Baopusi under the taking. Supreme Clarity Section for Alchemical Texts Dea Zhang editions encompass six Wan, three each for the inner and outer chapters. Most received versions of Baopusa descend from this Ming Dea Zhang text. Outer Chapters the Baopusi inner and outer chapters discuss miscellaneous topics ranging from esotericism to social philosophy. The inner chapters discuss techniques of Xian, immortality, transcendence, Chinese alchemy, meditation, Daoist yoga, Dayan, sexual techniques, Chinese herbology, demons, and Fu, magic talismans. The outer chapters discuss Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, legalism, government, politics, literature, scholarship, and include GE's autobiography, which Whaley called the fullest document of this kind that early China produced. Translations According to GE Hong's autobiography, he divided the inner and outer chapters on the distinction between Daoism and Confucianism. Ge philosophically described Daoism as the Ben, Root, Trunk, Origin and Confucianism as the Mo, Tip, Branch, End. When asked, which has the priority, Confucianism or Taoism? Baopusi replies, Taoism is the very trunk of Confucianism, but Confucianism is only a branch of Taoism. Significance While the Baopusi inner and outer chapters differ in content, they share a general format with an unnamed interlocutor posing questions and Ji Hong providing answers. The conventional syntax is Huaoan Yu. Someone asked, saying, and Baopusi to you? Baopusi answered, saying. The 20 Neopian inner chapters record arcane techniques for achieving Xian transcendence, immortality. These techniques span two types of Chinese alchemy that Tang Dynasty scholars later differentiated into Neodan, internal elixir, internal alchemy and Weidan, External elixir, external alchemy. The word dan, cinnabar, red, pellet, pill means pill of immortality, or elixir of life. Ji Hong details his researches into the arts of transcendence and immortality. Internal alchemy concerns creating an immortal body within the corporeal body through both physiological methods and mental practices. External or laboratory alchemy concerns compounding elixirs, writing fu talismans or amulets, herbalism, and exorcism. Lai outlines the inner chapter's subjects. Proofs of the per se existence of immortals and transcendent states of immortality of the body, stipulation of the accessibility to the perfect state of long life to everyone, irrespective of one's social status but dependent on whether one could study deeply and strenuously cultivate the necessary esoteric methods, elaboration of diverse esoteric techniques leading one to become a Xi'an immortal, 
and descriptions and criticism of the diverse contemporary Taoist discourses and sects. Several chapters have specific themes. Chapters 4, 8, 11, and 16 describe weight and external alchemy. Inner Chapter 18 details meditation practices. In Chapter 19, Ji Hong praises his master Zheng Yin, catalogues Daoist books, and lists talismans. Many scholars have praised the inner chapters. Joseph Needham, who called Ji Hong the greatest alchemist in Chinese history, quoted the following passage about medicines from different biological categories. Interlocutor, life and death are predetermined by fate and their duration is normally fixed. Life is not something any medicine can shorten or lengthen. A finger that has been cut off cannot be joined on again and expected to continue growing. Blood from a wound, though swallowed, is of no benefit. Therefore, it is most inappropriate to approve of taking such non-human substances as pine or thuya to protract the brief span of life, K.O., according to your argument. A thing is beneficial only if it belongs to the same category as that which is treated. If we followed your suggestion and mistrusted things of a different type, we would be obliged to crush flesh and smelt bone to prepare a medicine for wounds, or to fry skin and roast hair to treat baldness. Water and soil are not of the same substance as the various plants, yet the latter rely upon them for growth. The grains are not of the same species as living men, yet living men need them in order to stay alive. Fat is not to be classed with fire, nor water with fish, yet when there is no more fat the fires dies, and when there is no more water, fish perish. Needham evaluated this passage, admittedly there is much in the Pao foods a which is wild, fanciful, and superstitious but here we have a discussion scientifically as sound as anything in Aristotle, and very much superior to anything which the contemporary Occident could produce. In addition to quoting early alchemical texts, the inner chapters describe Ji Hong's laboratory experiments. Wu and Davis mention the Baopusa formula for making mosaic gold a golden crystalline powder used as a pigment from Xi'an. Red crystal salt and huizi. Lime water. The description of one process deserves special discussion, for it evidently concerns the preparation of stannic sulfide or mosaic gold and is perhaps the earliest known description of the preparation of this interesting substance. Mosaic gold exists in flakes or leaflets which have the color and the luster of gold, it does not tarnish and is used at present for bronzing radiators, gilding picture frames and similar purposes. As K.O. Hung describes the process, tin sheets, each measuring 6 inches square by 1 and 2 tenths inches thick, are covered with a 1 tenth inch layer of a mud-like mixture of chihyen and hyichi, 10 pounds of tin to every 4 of chihyen. They are then heated in a sealed earthenware pot for 30 days with horse manure. All the tin becomes ash-like and interspersed with bean-like pieces which are the yellow gold. The large portion of the metallic tin is converted into some ash-like compound or possibly into the ash-like allotropic modification, grey tin. A small portion of the tin is converted into bean-sized aggregates of flaky stannic sulfide. The yield is poor, for the author says that 20 ounces of gold are obtained from every 20 pounds of tin used. The authors add, it seems likely that K.O. Hung was personally experienced in the chemistry of tin, for the Chinese say that he was the first to make tin foil and that he made magic or spirit money out of it. The 50 Wapian outer chapters are more diffuse than the inner ones. 
Ji Hong diversely wrote essays on Jin dynasty issues in philosophy, morality, politics, and society. This Baopuzi portion details everyday problems among Han dynasty northerners who fled into South China after the fall of Luoyang. Some of the outer chapters are thematically organized. Ji Hong wrote chapters 46, 47, and 48 to dispute three adversaries. Guo Tai, founded of the Kingdom Pure Conversation School, and I Hung, was an infamously arrogant official of CAO CAO, and Bao Jinjian, was an early anarchist philosopher. The Chinese Bao Puzi has been translated into English. Italian, German, and Japanese. There are more English translations of the 20 inner chapters than the 50 outer chapters. The inner chapters have several partial translations. Tenny L. Davis, Professor of Organic Chemistry at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, collaborated on first translations of the inner chapters relevant to the history of alchemy. Wu and Davis translated chapters 4 on the gold medicine and 16 on the yellow and white. Davis and CHN translated chapters 8 overcoming obstructions and 11 on Qian medicines, and provided paraphrases or summaries of the remaining inner chapters. The French sinologist Eugene Fiefel made English translations of chapters 1 to 3, 4, and 11. More recently, excerpts from the inner chapters are quoted by Verellen and Pregadio. The inner chapters have one complete translation by James R. Ware, which also includes G. E. Hong's autobiography from Outer Chapter 50. Several reviewers censured the quality of Ware's translation, for instance, Kroll called it at times misguided. Huard's and Wang's critical assessment of Ware was criticized in turn by Sivan. Their review, nonetheless, can only be described as perfunctory. Only the formatter and end matter of Ware's book are evaluated, and that in a curiously cursory fashion. Translating the fundamental Daoist word Dao or Tao Wei, path. Principle as English God is a conspicuous peculiarity of Ware's Baopusa version. The introduction gives a convoluted Christian justification, first quoting J.J.L. Duvan Dak's translation of Dao Jing 25, its rightful name I do not know, but I give it the sobriquet Tao. If a rightful name is insisted upon, I would call it maximal. Then, Upon noticing that Tao Te Ching, verse 34, is willing to call the something minimal, every schoolman would have understood that the Chinese author was talking about God, for only in God do contraries become identical. Accordingly, the present translator will always render this use of the term Tao by God. In doing so, he keeps always in mind as the one and only definition the equation establishable from Exodus 3 13 15 and Mark 12 26 27, to mention only two very clear statements. It will be recalled that in the first God says, My name is I am, I live, I exist, while the second reads, God is not of the dead but of the living. Therefore, God equals life or being. Where admitted his God for Dao translation cannot be applied consistently. It is clear that the word Tao appears frequently in this text not as a designation of God but of the process by which God is to be approximated or attained. In such cases I shall translate it as the divine process. In instances where either this or God would be appropriate, a translator is obliged to be arbitrary. The term Tao Shi is rendered processor, Xian is translated genie rather than immortal. These Chinese words are Dao Shi, Daoist priest, 
Daoist practitioner and Xian. Immortal, transcendent. Ho Peng Yok, an authority in the history of science and technology in China, criticized Ware's mistranslations. It may be true that in certain areas the concept of Tao overlaps with the definition and attributes of God, or for that matter with those of Allah, for example oneness and eternity. However, there is the danger of the analogy being pushed too far. Similarly, the reader might be warned that genii, as used for rendering the word Qian, does not convey the concept of some supernatural slaves as found in the Lamp and the Ring of the Thousand and One Nights. The reviewer prefers the terminology used by Tenny L. Davis, i.e. Tao left untranslated and immortal for Xian. Nevertheless, Ho's review concluded with praise. Professor Ware is to be congratulated for bringing out the translation of a most difficult Chinese Taoist text in a very readable form. One cannot find another text that gives so much useful and authoritative information on alchemy and Taoism in 4th century China. Ji Hong wrote the Baopuzi in elegant classical Chinese grammar and terminology, but some inner chapter contexts are difficult to translate. Comparing three versions of this passage listing Xian medicines illustrates the translational choices. The best Xian medicine is cinnabar. Others in the order of decreasing excellence are gold, silver, qi, the five jades, mica, pearl, realgar, taiiuyu liang, shi cheng huangzi, shi ki, quartz, shi nao. Shi Lu Huang, Wild Honey, and Tseng Qing. Medicines of superior quality for immortality are, Cinnabar, next comes gold, then follows silver, then the many qi, then the five kinds of jade, then mica, then ming chu, then realgar, then brown hematite, then conglomerate masses of brown hematite, then stone cassia, then quartz, then paraffin, then sulfur, then wild honey, then malachite. At the top of the genie's pharmacopoeia stands cinnabar. Second comes gold, third, silver, fourth, excrescences, fifth, the jades, sixth, mica, seventh, pearls, eighth, realgar, ninth, brown hematite. 10th, conglomerate brown hematite, 11th, quartz, 12th, rock crystal, 13th, geodes, 14th, sulfur, 15th, wild honey, and 16th, laminar malachite. The Bayapusi outer chapters have one partial translation into English. J. Saley translated 21 of the 50 chapters. 1, 3, 5, 14 to 15, 20, 24 to 26, 30 to 34, 37, 40, 43 to 44, 46 to 47, and 50. In addition, Sali included appendices on Buddhism and the Pao Piyutsa, biography of Kao Hung from the Jin Shu, and recensions of lost Baopusa fragments quoted in later texts. Kroll gave a mixed review, although Salee's renderings frequently obscure K.O. Hung's carefully polished diction and nuance, they reliably convey the sense of the original and should be a substantial boon to Western students of medieval Chinese thought and culture. For centuries, traditional scholars have revered the Baopuzi as a canonical Daoist scripture but in recent years, Modern scholars have re-evaluated the text. Traditional scholarship viewed the Baopuzi, especially the inner chapters, as a primary textual source for early Chinese weight and external alchemy. Wu and Davis described it as probably the widest known and highest regarded of the ancient Chinese treatises on alchemy. 
it has been preserved for us as part of the Taoist canon. It shows us the art matured by five or six centuries of practice, having its traditional heroes and an extensive literature, its technique and philosophy now clearly fixed, its objectives and pretensions established. This art the author examines in a hard-headed manner and expounds in language which is remarkably free from subterfuge. Arthur Whaley praised G. E. Hong's rational attitude toward alchemy. Nowhere in Pao Piyudza's book do we find the hierophantic tone that pervades most writings on alchemy both in the East and in the West. He uses a certain number of secret terms, such as Metal Lord and River Chariot, both of which mean lead, and The Virgin on the River, which means Mercury. But his attitude is always that of a solidly educated layman examining claims which a narrow-minded orthodoxy had dismissed with contempt. In the estimation of Ho, the Baopuzi is a more important alchemical text than Weiboyang's Kantung Chi. The Kinship of the Three The Baopuzi mentions a Neijing, Inner Classic by Weiboyang but curiously does not mention Wei's Kantung Ji. Modern scholarship has taken another look at the Baopuzi. Sivan demeans the text's significance. The inner chapters are anything but the writings of a Taoist man of wisdom or organizer for his disciples or for other initiates. This book is a vast trove of commonplaces and hearsay about popular beliefs in which K.O.'s few incontestably Taoist texts play an essential but small part. Its goal is not to catalogue, synthesize, or provide a handbook of techniques. It is rather a dialogue in which K.O. hurls scattershot against a skeptical anonymous interlocutor. The inner chapters are a one-issue book. K.O. seeks to convince his questioner, and thereby his readers, that immortality is a proper object of study and is attainable not only by the ancients but in his own time, not only by a destined few but by anyone with enough faith to undertake arduous and dangerous disciplines. The devotion that K.O. calls for implies wholesale acceptance of legends, myths, tales of prodigies, magical beliefs religious faiths practically every belief current in the popular imagination of K.O.'s time and the inverse in almost every sense of what fundamentalist Confucian humanists considered worthy of thought. Sivan sarcastically compares G. E. Hong, an obsessed bookman and indiscriminate lore collector, with Alan Watts. K.O.'s style was rather than of a pedantic purveyor of occultism to the upper class. I can only think of him as the Alan Watts of his time. However, James Ben observes, this judgment is perhaps not as damning as Professor Sivan intended. Certainly, one would not now go to Watts in the hope of learning much about Taoism, but a close study of his work would tell us a great deal about perceptions and presuppositions concerning Asian religions in mid-20th century America. Like Watts and others of his generation it is true that G. E. Hong did see religion as a personal matter, and he seems to have approached it from the point of view of a fan or enthusiast more than as an initiate. Chi Tim Lai interprets the inner chapters as a new discourse on Xian immortality through personal salvation and perfection, contrasting with the traditional imperial discourse that only the rich could afford Xian hood. For example, histories record that both Qin Shi Huang and Emperor Wu of Han dispatched imperial naval expeditions to obtain the elixir of immortality from mythical Mount Pengle. That is, an individual's self-perfection is only dependent upon ascetic, mystic, and ethical behavior. Since it is a new religious discourse supposedly open to all people, the quest for a prolonged life is no longer the preserve of the wealthy and powerful. According to K.O. Hung, 
the Xi'an immortals who can achieve the complete avoidance of death rarely come from the social groups of worthies, emperors, or sages. Hence, he implies that Xi'an immortality are distinctive human ideal values to be pursued and potentially achieved by anyone. In the first, in order to differentiate the ideal values of Xi'an immortal from this worldly worthies and powers, K.O. Hung says, those who attained immortal were almost all poor and lowly. They were not men of position and power. Second, in placing the ideal of Xi'an immortality out of the reach of imperial figures, K.O. Hung rebukes emperors such as the first emperor of the Qin and emperor Han Wu Ti, who were models of seeking for immortality in ancient Chinese history and literature, by saying, these two emperors had a hollow reputation for wanting immortality, but they never experienced the reality of cultivating the Tao. Ji Hong quotes his teacher Zheng Yin explaining that poverty forces Dea Shi Daist practitioners seeking Xian techniques to engage in the difficulties and dangers of alchemy. Then I asked further. Why should we not eat the gold and silver which are already in existence instead of taking the trouble to make them? What are made will not be real gold and silver but just make believes. Said Cheng Chun in reply, the gold and silver which are found in the world are suitable for the purpose. But Tao Shi are all poor, witness the adage that Xi'an are never stout and Tao Shi never rich. Tao Shi usually go in groups of five or ten, counting the teacher and his disciples. Poor as they are, how can they be expected to get the necessary gold and silver? Furthermore they cannot cover the great distances to gather the gold and silver which occur in nature. The only thing left for them to do is to make the metals themselves. Where translates this adage? There are no fat genii and no rich processors. For a wealthy person seeking Xian transcendence, Ji Hong recommends compounding Jinyi, golden liquor in a huachi, a vinegar solvent. This is simpler to produce than traditional juding. Nine tripods elixirs, but expensive eight doses cost 400,000 cash. True it is that the nine medicines are the best of Xi'an medicines. Yet the materials for their compounding are quite numerous. They are easily procurable only in large cities which have good facilities for communication, but are not to be obtained at other places. Furthermore, in the compounding of the medicines, the fires should be tended for tens of days and nights with industrious application and close adjustment which is a great difficulty. The compounding of the gold fluid is much easier. There the only thing which is difficult is to get the gold. One pound in the old measure is equivalent to two in our contemporary measure. Such a quantity of gold would cost only some 300,000 cash. The other auxiliary materials are easy to procure. In the compounding, no fire is required. All that needs to be done is to have the mixture in a hua chih for the necessary number of days. A total expenditure of 400,000 cash will make an amount large enough to transform eight persons into Xi'an. Just as no wine is formed by the fermentation of small quantities of rice, so small quantities of materials will not be able to interact to give the medicine. Pregadio says recent studies show GE's intent was glorifying the religious and ritual legacy of Jiangnan, emphasizing the superiority of certain traditions over others, and enhancing their prestige among the social elite to which Ji Hong belonged. Nonetheless, Pregadio concludes. Ji Hong's testimony deserves attention as a valuable overview of the religious traditions of Jiangnan just before the way of the celestial masters spread to that area, soon followed by the Shangqing and Lingbao revelations. From this point of view, 
the Baopozii documents important links between the earlier and later history of Taoism, as it also does for medicine and other fields.